Back with that 66 Marshall 1973, which is the 2x12 version of the Marshall 18 watt. I am really pleased with how this came out. I had to do some relatively simple but thorough and effective work on this. You can see a hint of the new bus bar there. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And you can see some new components as well. Now here's a better view of that bus wire. Other techs like to use a big 12 or 14 gauge bit of wire. I prefer to use two uh, sections of 18 gauge tinned bus wire and then twist them together to make the equivalent of one large piece. The large copper pieces, you know, it's really hard to get them to tin and to accept solder. I find that this gives the same structural support, the same effectiveness, but it's much easier to work with and they don't tarnish. Ignore that little bit of solder laying there by the, uh, the ground point. I did find and remove that later on. Here's another view of the bus wire, and it's only going to chassis there at that one point near the input jacks. And I did some new 20 gauge bus wire from each pot connection to the bus wire, which you know reinforces everything, holds it in place. You can see it's got a new 1K linear taper pot for the intensity on the tremolo. Now here you can see I've got some new wire in place, and that pink one I'm pointing out here, uh, that's the original wire there, and uh, it was not really well sealed, and the strands of the wire are beginning to separate, and they're corroded, and that corrosion kind of builds up and can really make for bad solder joints. So I replaced the pink, the black, and some of the green wires with some new top coat stuff of the correct size and color to eliminate that as being a problem in the behavior of the amp. Now, the V1 tube socket, as I showed in the previous video, is really loose. So I've replaced it here with a Belton, and you can see that some of the original wiring there on the heater and the cathode is not lovely, but that's as it was. And if I were to mess with it too much, the uh, insulation would melt off. Redid the grid connections, dressing them as far away from the black and red heater wires as possible. That's why they're going off the way that they are. And I also put in a stainless steel screw and a stainless steel nylock nut to hold the new socket in place. Now here is the new socket on the right and the two original sockets remaining on the left. And um, the one on the right had to be replaced. It was just way too loose. The two on the left, you can see as I vibrate them, that the socket itself, the ceramic base, is moving inside the enclosure. And they're on the verge of failing. And if the owner wants me to change them out, I'd be glad to. If he wants me to leave them original just because, that's fine as well. Uh, the other argument besides the vibration is if he wants to use tube shields, that one on the left is too malformed and the dimple's been dented in, it cannot take a tube shield. The one in the middle can kind of, sort of, if you force it, which is not great. The new one, no problem whatsoever. Down here at the filter cap end of things, I redid all the connections there because they were really poor, and I removed the grounding hardware from the chassis and cleaned all the surfaces and then replaced the old, not very good grounding tab with a new larger one. I gave it a new bus wire from the cap to that ground and then connected the ground from the center tap coming from the power transformer. And then for the purposes of this video, it looks ugly because I have the uh, AC safety ground temporarily connected there. That's going to get moved to its very own chassis ground lug when I replace that cable. Speaking of replacing the cable, the app came in with a replacement UK plug and then a US adapter. Now, the step up and step down transformer that I have accepts both the UK and a US plug. Here's the US, and then you'll see the UK. Uh, so the question I have for the owner is, does he want me to put a UK cable on, molded cable, so that it's a reminder to go into 240? Or does he want a cable with a US plug? It's his choice. Now here you can see uh, the new components that are in place. Two non-original resistors on the right there, the cathode and the plate, have been replaced with two pyres that I happen to have in my stash and a new uh, cathode bypass cap there. And that black wire going from the 100K plate resistor to the junction of those two caps you see there has been replaced because the old one was all frayed and kind of yucky. Those three caps you see there are some Synergy Royal Mustards, and they are the correct values. This amp came in with uh, very nice Wema and Phillips mustard caps of the incorrect values. You can see in the previous video that the 10 nanofarad phase inverter input was a 22 nanofarad uh, mustard that had been spliced on, tack soldered to a, a different lead because it wasn't long enough. 
So this restores the original performance and sound of the amp and all that fun stuff. And it's a shame that the originals were long lost. And down here at the tone circuit of the tremolo channel, you can see there's also a royal mustard. The uh, non-original Wima was not long enough to reach the bus wire, but I knew I, I could do it with this. So let me let you hear it for a little bit. I'll let you hear each channel. Uh, pay attention that on channel two, the vibrato channel, which is where we start, there is absolutely no hum. There's a bit of hum remaining at the highest gain settings on channel one. We'll get there and we'll talk about why that is. As you can hear, there's some hum in the background that's audible through the speaker on this channel at, at the highest gain settings. It goes away pretty much once you get to one o'clock and lower, which still has quite a bit of gain for the guitar. You know, it's there, but it's way behind the level of the guitar. When the amp came in, it was just a massive, massive, terrible hum because of the ground problems and everything that I fixed. Let's talk about why that hum is still there in this channel. It's not there in the other. First of all, keep in mind that this amp has very low filtering. 32, 32, 32. Later Marshalls would have added one additional filtering stage, but this is a 1966 example with an EZ81, so I don't want to increase the filtering or do any, quote, fixes to the original circuit. It is now a very healthy sounding example of how it was designed. Here you can see R31 there, the volume, the 500K audio. That's the volume pot for the first channel, the channel which has some hum. And it goes straight to C1, which is the newly added 10 nanofarad cap, which is the input of the phase inverter on that side. This channel has that little bit of hum. And here you can see what's happening in channel 2, which does not have the hum. Look over to the left where it says V3A pin 6. You can see a wire goes from that to the right and does that little loop around the wire going to pin 1. And then goes to C15, which is a 4.7 or 5 nanofarad cap. And then that goes to C12, which is another 5 nanofarad, 4.7 nanofarad cap. But there's a junction there between them, R29, which is a 470K to ground. And then after C12, ignore the tone pot, R35 there is another 500K volume pot, which is also a ground reference. And this forms a two-stage filter circuit, because you have 5 nanofarad followed by 470K to ground, going to 5 nanofarad, going to 500K to ground, that is a two-pole filter. 
So it removes a lot of lows. If you look at the volume for channel one, that filter is not present. You don't lose those lows. They're not filtered out. In fact, look at on the right here, C18, that 22 nanofarad with 470K to the junction of the phase inverter. That is forming yet a third filter on channel two. So channel two has three stages of filtering. Channel one has one. And that's why channel one has some hum and channel two does not. In the real world, channel one still sounds quite good, even with that hum. So I'll let you hear a little bit more, and then I'll talk to the owner, and we'll button this thing up and make it perfect. Mm -hmm. 